back in the fall of 1979. Me and one of my older brothers were uh, whitetail hunting down on the Red River. So I go over in the edge of the woods, probably about five yards, and I'm laying down on that, that deer trail looking back, back northwest. It was just a little after daylight when I got down there and got set up. Well, by 7.30 or 8 o'clock, I see something across that horseshoe on the slough side, and it was probably it's about 10 foot from the edge of the field to the, to the edge where it dropped off, and it dropped off probably a good 35 foot. I thought it was a skunk. It comes up, and pretty soon I see his eyes, then I see its nose, and then I see its chin, and I shoulders, and it reaches up, and it grabs two leaves off a, a sweet gum tree and eats them. And I'm going, holy crap, look at this. Well, it walks on up the bank, and pretty soon I see the arms, the waist, and the legs, and then when it stands up, I just about come out of my skin. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved. Uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. This is Tina from Athens, Georgia, and you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, we're going to be chatting with uh, DJ tonight. And DJ actually comes to us from one of my favorite states, uh, Texas. And he had an encounter with uh, him and his brother uh, were hunting back in 1979 in North Texas and had a run-in with this creature. Uh, we'll be chatting about that tonight. You know, on the show, a lot of times I play vocals or suspected vocals that Sasquatch make. And to be honest with you, it's one of my favorite parts of the show. I always love playing uh, different sounds for you guys to listen to. And, you know, we all get a chance to kind of listen to it. And uh, there's a story that came out of Cape Cod uh, with regard to a diver and a humpback whale. And it's one of those stories that is definitely stranger truth is stranger than fiction and before i play that that encounter uh, a pretty unbelievable encounter uh what i thought i'd do is keep with the theme of the show uh, you know humpback whales they make some of the most beautiful sounds this sound that i'm about to play for you was a humpback whale and her newborn calf and they just make these weird haunting uh almost song like sounds uh let's take a listen
It almost kind of sounds fake, but that actually is uh, the sounds that were captured uh, from a humpback whale along with her young. And they're huge mammals. I mean, they're the size of a school bus. I think they can weigh up to like 40 tons or something like that. And there's a strange story that came out of Cape Cod. Uh, This guy who's been diving his whole life, he'll dive down. I think he was actually trying to get lobsters. And he was about 35 feet down. And then everything went dark. And he describes what happened. This is crazy. Let's take a listen. Epic encounter at sea. A Cape Cod lobster diver is recovering from injuries after he says he got caught in the mouth of a humpback whale. Our David Beenick just spoke with this man and is in la- is live and well fleet. David, this is unbelievable. Absolutely, Maria. It is a whale of a tail. Some might say a whopper of a fish story, but this one comes with eyewitnesses. He's trying to get me out. Still in scrubs from his trip to the hospital, Michael Packard has <laughs> pains in his legs and a story of biblic proportions. Packard was diving off his lobster boat, was near the bottom when he says all of a sudden he felt as if he'd been hit by a truck. And everything went black. And all I could feel was just muscle and skin all around me. Packard says he was in total darkness and he could feel the whale's movement in the water. But at first, he didn't realize what was happening. It was like... It, Did I just get bit by a shark or no, it's not a shark. I'm in a whale's mouth. You figured that out while you're inside the whale. Yes. He struggled, thought about his wife and two sons and thought he might die. Then after about 20 or 30 seconds, he says the whale spit him out. And then all of a sudden I saw light and white water everywhere. And all of a sudden I was thrown from his mouth, he he was shaking his head, trying to eject me out of his mouth. Packard's shipmate saw him come flying out of the water. The captain of a charter boat that was nearby says he did too. Wasn't sure what it was. Then when I saw the, the white flipper fin on the side, I go, that's a whale. It's, and then all of a sudden I see Mike feet first coming out of the water like this. I, I think I was in shock a bit. I, I had to actually pull over and call him back and... and and say, what What did you tell me? Peckard says the whale was a humpback about 35 to 40 feet long that might have mistaken his scuba bubbles for a school of fish. He says the last thing he saw was the whale's tail swimming away. As soon as I landed in the water and was floating there in excruciating pain, I was like, oh my God, I'm alive. What a story. Well, Packard says he does have some pain in his legs, but the whale never broke the skin. Packard says he plans to be back in the water as soon as he's feeling a bit better. In fact, he says he feels very lucky. While he was at the hospital, a nurse came up and asked him to jot down some lottery numbers. Lottery numbers? (laughs) Crazy account. You know, can I just complain for one second? Why do all these news stations, they always have these reporters next to a freeway? I mean, can you imagine if I did the show like this? Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. You, you would go insane. You'd be like, why is he next to a freeway? I don't know. Maybe I'm just a sound guy, and it, it drives me nuts when I hear that. Uh, but uh, I'm glad he made it. Definitely a very strange account, very cool account. Uh, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out SasquatchChronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, TJ to the show. TJ, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on, TJ. And I know you had quite the encounter back in the late 70s in North Texas. Uh, if you would, would you just kind of start from the beginning, kind of tell us what you were doing and walk us into what happened? Well, it's back in the fall of 1979. Me and one of my older brothers were uh, whitetail hunting down the Red River and uh, in the river bottoms. And it's it's quite a ways down in there, you know. Uh, we used to go down there on one of the old sloughs and, and shoot guns and, and uh, you know, just target practice down there. But it's probably four or five miles down in there. There's old peanut farms and and hay fields and stuff like that. So we made it down in there and it rained the night before and 
we couldn't make it to a mud hole, so we ended up parking on the side of the, the field. We walked probably a quarter mile down to that slough. And uh, my brother, he picked him a spot out where he was going to sit and, and hunt. So I went on north and walked up the edge of the slough and went to the very end where there's kind of a horseshoe that, that goes in and comes back out where a tractor goes in with a disc, you know, and turns around and he keeps he keeps disking. But there's a game trail off the north, be the northwest corner that goes down into the slough down to the river. And it comes up and it comes across the horseshoe and goes back in the edge of the woods on the be the east side. So I go over in the edge of the woods probably about five yards and I'm laid down on that, that deer trail looking back back northwest. And that was about it was just a little after daylight when I got down there and got set up. Well, about seven thirty or eight o'clock, I see something across that horseshoe on the slough side. And it was probably it's about ten foot from the edge of the field to the to the edge where it dropped off, and it dropped off probably a good thirty five foot. Well, I thought it was a skunk, so I'm watching it, and I was going to shoot it, and uh, I waited. Well, it's looking around. You see how you see it going back and forth, back and forth. Well, what it was doing was that Bigfoot was crawling up that steep bank and he was sticking his feet in that bank and coming up a little at a time and he was looking across the field. But he comes up and pretty soon I see his eyes, then I see its nose, and then I see its chin, and then shoulders, and then it reaches up and it grabs two leaves off a, a sweet gum tree and eats them. And I'm going, holy crap, look at this. Well, it walks on up the bank, and pretty soon I see the arms, the waist, and the legs. And then when it stands up, I just about come out of my skin. Well, it walked around there kind of in a circle at first, and it's looking back and forth across the field to the marsh. And it picks off a couple more leaves off that sweet gum tree, and it's eating them, and it's looking around. When it comes out into the field, and uh, it it heads towards where I'm laying at on that game trail and starts, and starts coming across that field. And uh, I got up, but I wasn't standing, you know, all the way up. I was kind of hunched over, and I was watching him. And, man, I got a shot of adrenaline. I went from zero to a million miles an hour in a second. And I come out of those that brush, and I was running, and I was quartering away from him. And he dropped straight down on all fours. And, uh, man, I ran. I was scared to death. Scared to death. And I was hollering for my brother. And I was hollering. And I was screaming. And I was running. And he was coming towards me. It looked like to me that he was going to cut me off at the edge of this corner of that, that slough. And I finally lost sight of him. And I run down to where my brother was at. And I just, I fell down on my knees, dropped my gun, and uh, I just freaked out. My brother told me, he said, get up, what's wrong with you? And all I could get out of my mouth was, my monster, my monster. And uh, I finally calmed down a little bit, and we ended up walking back down there. I asked him if he'd seen it, but he wouldn't say a word. He just shook his head. We get back down there. And uh, I showed him where I was laying. I showed him my footprints. We went over there and looked at the Bigfoot's footprints. And he sunk down in that field, probably two and a half inches, three inches. Probably 14, 15 inches long. His heels were extra long, like I was telling you before. And uh, But I was, I was close to him. I was real close, 50, 50, 60 foot from him. He had some red eyes. I mean, red eyes. Let me ask you real quick, TJ, before we go into the description, because I know you're very close to this creature, um, I want to ask you, so you and your brother go down there, um, and I'll kind of give away a portion of the story that he actually did see the creature, but he didn't tell you until, he didn't really tell you anything at that moment, but you guys go down there and you find these tracks, and uh, what did your brother say? I mean, what was the conversation like? He looked at him, and his cigarette fell out of his mouth. 
and he didn't. He just shook his head. He wouldn't say nothing. He didn't know what to say because my, my tracks are over here, and now there's tracks of something else here. You know, I, I think he was trying to analyze it, but uh, yeah, I was pretty. I was pretty shaken up. But this thing was coming at me because it went when it went down on all fours. It looked like it growled a little bit. I could see his teeth. What looked like canines, I don't know. They were a little bit longer than the rest of his teeth. But it was taking taking short steps. And when it stepped, it was one foot after another. And I've never seen that. And then his stride got longer and longer. And when it got to my footsteps and I was on down, coming around the corner, it actually ran back towards the marsh and jumped off back in that marsh down that 35 foot and only until last year my brother finally talked about it and he told me he said he seen something black he didn't know what it was but it jumped back off in the in that slough he said he seen something black know what it was but whatever it was jumped back off in the slough and that was a heck of a drop man you know i'm it's a good 35 foot down if he was set on the bank you you could slide down in there with no problem. That's how steep the bank was. Yeah, and I think you handled the whole situation extremely well, probably m better than most adults would. Uh, and what's fascinating is it's 1979, so you know Bigfoot's not really uh, you're not really going to see a whole lot on TV, or you know back then there wasn't a ton of information like there is now. Uh, for the audience, you were so close to this creature. For the audience, can you kind of describe what you saw? Its head was kind of pointed. It did, it did not have a neck. The muscles came from the outside of its shoulders to the, the I'd say, the base of the ears. Uh, it had really red eyes. I seen a little brown. I could even see the lines in its eyes. And the eyelashes looked like they were messed up. I don't know or the eyelids, I'm sorry. It looked like it had double eyelids, but you know, I, I'm probably wrong on that aspect, but when it was blinking its eyes, there was something going on there that I couldn't, I couldn't figure out. Uh, the arms were extra long. It had hair that hung down from the bottom of its arms. It was black. It had grass and leaves in with the hair. I guess where it had been sleeping that morning, I don't know. But uh, it was tall. It was a good eight foot, and it probably had four foot shoulders on it, but it was kind of scrawny looking. Like I told you before, it looked like it was malnourished. You could see the ribs on the bottom. Uh, you could see it. You could see through a portion of the hair that was on its body, and you could see it kind of gray black skin. Not like it had the mange, but just where the the hair was thinner. You know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely do. But it had some real big cheekbones, big brow across its forehead, across its eyes. It had some human characteristics, but it was not human. It was an animal. What human characteristics did it have? You know, in the face, you could tell it looked part human in the face because it had a big nose and the nose was flat. But it had a big nose. The nostrils were turned down, not up like a monkey or a gorilla but it just it looked human you know yeah it's scary man especially being for well any age really being that close to one of these creatures and when you and i were talking you, you said you knew it was a male we don't have to go into it but you you knew it was actually a male yeah i could see it's gentle tell you yeah it, it was male yeah a couple things really fascinate me about your encounter uh, one is the double eyelids, and uh, we can go into that another time. But the red eyes uh, the really, really fascinate me, especially since it's during the day. Uh, were the eyes glowing red? No, they were not. They were sunken back a little bit in its head. Yeah, that's strange. So they weren't glowing. It was more or less kind of a reddish tone? Yes. Yeah, it's very strange about the reddish tint. Uh, the creature probably had no clue you were even there till the last moment. I mean, that's kind of my impression. I think it would have walked over on that deer trail where I was laying. That's what I thought. Now, it never seen me until I come out of that brush. And when I come out of that brush, I was running. 
to me, I was running for my life. That's what I thought. And that's the reason I, I was terrified, man, because it was coming towards me after it went down, it got up and it was walking hunched over coming towards me. I thought, Oh, good God, here we go. Yeah. I can't imagine being 14 years old. You're out there hunting and you see this thing you've never seen before. And then you get to, you're going to take off running. And at the last moment, you kind of look back and it's dropping down on all fours and, and you see teeth. Pretty much with his mouth open, almost like he was growling at me. I think I spooked him as much as he, he scared me. Cause like I say, he never knew I was there until I got out of the brush. I'm always kind of amazed by the intelligence of these creatures. You know, the, from talking to you and, and reading your email, uh, over the last couple of days, you know, the, the creature didn't necessarily come after you. Uh, it, it did in the beginning, but then it went to almost cut you off. And that's, that's kind of the scary part. I think so. He was walking towards me because if he wanted, if he wanted to got me, I think he could have got me. I think he, I think he could have. Yeah. And here we are almost 40 years ago and you're in North Texas and you're running into this saying, um, at the time, what did you think it was? You know, I didn't know. All I could think of was Bigfoot. That's all I could think of. Now, there's, there's, there's a big history of them being around here and them being on the river. Uh, a lot of the old people, some of them will talk about it and some of them won't. But there was an incident upriver probably 10 miles where one walked through a community and walked through the, walked through these people's yard. There's just been a history of them that you don't hear a lot of, but it, it's there. Yeah. There's definitely a long history of it down there. If you look in a lot of the historical records, you won't find Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Uh, you'll find wild men, uh, boogers, that sort of thing. And uh, even Davy Crockett talked about it. Uh, he claimed to have shot, he shot something in Tennessee, I know he's not from Texas, but Davy Crockett's a very important figure in Texas history and culture. And even in Tennessee, he talked about shooting a Yahoo, a 10 foot tall, hairy giant uh, while out in the woods. There's a weird letter um, that Davy Crockett wrote to his brother-in-law about running into a half man, half beast out there near where what's called today is Crockett National Forest. Uh, I've been kind of looking into that, but I'm getting way off track. Uh, the point is, there definitely is a long history of it there in Texas. How did this affect you? I mean, did you guys go out camp camping or hunting after this encounter? No, no. I never went back to that spot ever. And it took me a good couple of years to get back out in the woods and, you know, and to get past it. And I still think about it to this day. And I'm a, I'm a pretty avid outdoorsman. But that's always in the back of my mind. And my senses are a little bit more heightened when I go out in the woods. I listen a little bit more, you know, and, and I'm watching a little bit a bit more. Yeah, nothing wrong with being more alert and kind of being aware of your surroundings. Uh, before we move on, I wanted to ask you about the, the tracks that you guys found. I know you said they were like 14, 15 inches long. Uh, one of the things about the tracks that really surprised you or kind of threw you off, you had mentioned uh, the long heel. The track is actually a barefoot print, just like you were outside barefooted, but it's, it's a lot bigger. Now, this animal had a longer heel. It's, he, he walked kind of funny too, but he still walked upright, you know what I mean? I'm going to say the heel stuck out probably two inches you know, horizontal to his foot backwards. Um, I've never seen anything like it, but I noticed it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Almost like it needed to grow into its foot. Yeah. Almost, almost. But this, this sighting and what happened there is burned in the back of my skull and I will never forget it. Yeah. I think it would definitely stay with most people. And the encounter itself, you know, the, the creature almost cutting you off is a little disturbing, but being such a young age and you recognized that it was cutting you off, um, I think is, is kind of impressive. I could definitely see why this would stay with you throughout your life. 
We got back home. I told my mom what happened. And she said, you got chased by Bigfoot? And I told her, yeah. And uh, I told my brother, I said, come in here and tell her what happened. He wouldn't say a word. He just shook his head. And she, she said, well, you boys be careful out there. I said, like, Mom, you don't understand what just happened. Huh? It almost got me. <laughs> you boys be careful out there. But I had a gun, and I run from this thing. And uh, it would be a different story now. It would be a different story. Yeah, I think uh, in that situation, it's probably best you didn't fire off a couple rounds. I think it would have went bad pretty quick. Uh, but, you know, being 14 years old and you have a large caliber rifle in your hand, uh, and, and a lot of times hunters don't shoot. Um, they shoot a lot less than most people might think. But looking back almost 40 years ago, you're in this situation. What, why didn't you shoot? I was scared to death. I was scared to death. All I could think of was I got to get away from this thing. There was nobody else that was there that were that was going to help me. Uh, I'd walked a good football field and probably uh, 150 yards way way north past my brother, so he couldn't even hear me hollering up there. But yeah, it was uh, it wasn't good. I think there's different kinds of them. I think there's big ones. I think there's little ones. Uh, I think they have different characteristics because this one that I seen with the pointed head looks nothing like the one that I've got the picture of. Yeah, I think that there probably is different types of these things. You know, no one really knows, but um, and we can come back to that in a moment. Um, I kind of want to go into your next experience. So a couple of years later, you're near this area and you were actually run out of the area. Uh, if you would tell us about that. Well, the first uh, encounter that I had, my stepdad had 350 acres that were down in the bottom. This is probably probably 20 miles from where that other one happened. I was deer hunting on a point on a ridge one evening, and I was sitting there overlooking the bottoms, and there's a creek that runs down through the bottoms. I didn't know what a wood knock was. I had no clue. Well... Pretty soon, I hear one. I hear a bang. I didn't think nothing about it. About 20 minutes later, bang, bang. There's two more big wood knocks. I thought, well, that's weird. Then another wood knock. And I'm like, well, I know nobody else was down there. You know, it's it takes a, way, it takes a long ways to, to get in there, and it's one road in and one road out. And then pretty soon after that, a tree goes down and I turn around. I was like, well, I better get up. So I start looking. I didn't see a thing. I didn't even see where the tree was that went down, but it was close. So I called it a day and I went on in. Well, later on, me and my buddy was down there deer hunting and we were in his vehicle. And have you ever been out in the woods where it's so dark? after the sun goes down that you literally cannot see your hand in front of your face. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's the way it was that night. We got back to the, to the vehicle after dark and we didn't have no flashlights. Well, it's his vehicle wouldn't start. And I'm like, well, this is good. So now we have to walk out. This is before cell phones. We're standing out there yakking at each other by the vehicle. Pretty soon here comes a flipping rock over the car. I'm talking about one size of a softball. I'm like, well, where in the hell did that come from? And I told my buddy, I said, you see that? He said, what? I said, man, something just threw a rock at us. Here comes a stick over the car. I'm like, what the hell, man? And my stepdad, he had cows, but there was none down there at the time. And pretty soon we heard some sapping, snapping, and, and cracking over in the edge of the woods. I told my buddy, I said, man, there's something over there. And we had, had in the past, we had had a black panther down there. It would come and go, you know, during the seasons. And we're standing there talking, and we both had deer rifles. I said, you know, when the only option we had was to walk out. So we're talking, and uh, we were both looking, too, you know, and we start walking out. Well, we start hearing footprints. I mean, big footprints. 
we walked probably about 20 yards and we stopped and we started hollering at it, you know, get out of here, get out of here. Well, we're standing there. We don't hear anything. We started walking again and it started walking again. When we stopped, it would stop. Well, that slow walk turned into a fast walk pretty quick. And we got probably halfway out to the gate and we're, you know, we stopped for a second and it stopped. It was pulling limbs back on trees and you could hear those limbs that go when they came back, when the limbs would come back around. Well, that turned into a run to the gate. And when we stopped that, that second time there, I shot once in the woods and he shot once in the woods. And, uh, it followed us all the way to the gate. He got through, and I got through the gate. And then it was another three miles out to the main road. But at the end of that road, there was, it was probably 200 yards up there, there was an old house, and there was a black couple that lived up there, an old black couple. And I told them, I said, come on, we're going to go up to the house up there. So we get up there. He's... We're standing by the porch, and I give him my deer rifle, and I told him, I said, I'm not going to walk up there with this gun. So he's standing by the edge of the porch, and I walk up there and knock on the door, and uh, I know that old man's name. And I said, Mr. So-and-so, I said, uh, we need to use your phone. And he had opened the door, and he shut the door, and he walked back in. And I flat out told him, I said, we're not leaving until we use your phone. So he opens up the door, sets the phone on the porch, and shuts the door. Well, I called a friend of mine, and he came down there and got us. But uh, whatever it was, it was close, and it followed us all the way out. Yeah, I hear this encounter, this type of encounter, probably more than any, any other encounter. And I find it very strange. I mean, even on Friday night show uh, with the members, we were talking about this. Well, Steve was my guest, and he had a very similar encounter like this. Uh, I want to ask you, TJ, was it following you from behind or was it following you off to the side? It was off to our, our left side. We crossed the gate and started up the hill. I couldn't hear it come across the road, but I heard it when he hit the other side of the road and went up a little, a little hill off in the woods and it was stepping on branches. And this thing was huge. You could tell by the way it was walking, it was big. And it was on two feet, it wasn't four. Yeah, and this type of behavior, I don't think that you ran into a person. I think it probably was one of these creatures. I've heard this encounter a million times. Uh, they generally will start off throwing something at you, and then as you leave, they will pace you out. And I don't, that's why I don't think it was a person. I mean, I don't think any sane person would pick up rocks and start throwing it at two armed men uh, in the dark and then follow them out. You know, I mean, just most hunters are cool, but... Uh, to me, that screams, please shoot me. But in the moment, what did you think was actually going on? I had no idea. Like I say, we didn't have flashlights, and it was it was pitch black. You could literally could not see in front of you. I, I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue. But later on, I'm leaning, you know, leaning towards thinking it was a Bigfoot down there. Those bottoms in that area... Nobody ever goes down there. There's no pressure. Uh, it would be a good spot. And there's a really large creek or river that runs through that section that runs into the Red River. So if a Black Panther could, if a Black Panther could live down there, so could it. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, and, and this type of behavior is odd to me. Uh, this encounter, like I said, I've heard so many times and you know, for me, it almost feels a little supernatural. And I told Steve that on Friday night show, uh, you know, if they're because people never actually see what's pacing them. They never actually see. It seems like it's just enough in the bush to where it can't you can't see it. But for some reason, it can see you. And the weird part is it matches you step for step. And you get up there in North Texas, try and pace someone where there's not obstacles in your way. And it's daylight. Uh, if you're trying to focus and you know, step for step, match them, you're going to trip, you're going to hurt, you're going to fall and hurt yourself. And it never seems to happen with these things. Uh, it's very strange. And that type of behavior, uh, what's your take on it, TJ? Do you think it's like intimidation to try and get you to leave? 
I think it is. I really do. Um, my stepdad, he used to lose cows all the time, and uh, I'd always ask him, you know, we're we're a couple of couple short on, on on cows or calves. I found a dead one down on the edge of the field, and uh, he'd say, "Oh, the varmint's must have got it." And I think he knew what was down there, but he wasn't gonna say nothing. I really do. Did anything else ever happen on that property when you were growing up, except for one missing cow? Yeah, yeah. One night it did. One night something chased. There was probably about a dozen cows. Chased them through uh, two barbed wire fences and past my place down the road. I had three dogs. Every one of them dogs went underneath the house. They went through the underpinning and went underneath the house, and they tore the screen off the front door trying to get in. So I took my shotgun, and I went out there, and the front of my house was probably, I don't know, 50 foot from the road. So I walk out there. It's so quiet, you can hear a pin drop. I mean, there was no sound whatsoever. I could not get them dogs out from underneath my house. So I'm standing out there, and I'm looking around. I don't know. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, oh. And I went back to the house and went back in and locked the door. And those dogs, they didn't come out till the next day. Something was out there, whether it was a black panther or a Bigfoot or whatever. But something was chasing those cows to run them through through two barbed wire fences. Yeah, and I think we're actually giving clues when these things show up. You know, like the hair on the back of your neck standing up, uh, the forest just going silent. And then your dog's reaction, you know, most large dogs, they're not going to cower from a panther. Uh, you get a bunch of them together, they're probably going to stand up and fight. And for them to run and hide and you couldn't get them out, uh, it almost, it's like the dog's telling you to go inside, get away from this thing. Uh, it's definitely fascinating stuff. I know all of this happened 35, 40 years ago, and I would definitely love to talk with your neighbor, but... Uh, your neighbor contacted you. He lives about seven miles down the road from you. And a lot of really bizarre things have been going on and around his property. Tell tell us about it, if you would. He was a non-believer. He didn't believe in Bigfoot. And his dad didn't believe in Bigfoot. And uh, they had their own encounters, and they changed their mind pretty dadgum quick. They have been hollered at. They've been screamed at. They've had sticks thrown uh, I mean, big sticks thrown at them on the tractor. They almost busted their windshield out. They threw a big limb at them. He's been down on the river driving T-posts, and uh, that ping, 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 and then when he stops driving a post in, he gets a whistle, and he's looking around. He's had a, he's had a lot to happen to him, a lot to happen to him. He was said he was sitting on the back of his side-by-side, checking his SIM cards on his cameras. Just a lot of, a lot of uh, grunting, monkey sounds would come up out of the bottoms when he was sitting there, you know, sitting on his side by side. And uh, he, he, said, he said he heard a lot that he couldn't explain. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the pictures here in a moment. Uh, I know there was just a couple pictures you sent me and there was a lot more that you're gonna send uh, my way. Um, but the, the neighbor actually hasn't seen the creature. He just, it seems like the throwing stuff at him, uh, he's hearing vocals. Is it, is it that sort of thing? Yes. Yes. He's had multiple, multiple vocals at one time. He said that one night there was three, uh, three different ones that were grunting and whistling in different locations at the same time. He had a dead calf one day that he had to drag off with a four wheeler. He drug it down on the edge of the field and unhooked the rope from it and it was turning around. And he said he ran out of gas on the full weather. Well, there was one standing in the edge of the creek there that he said he hollered at him. And he said it was so loud that he, he felt it in his chest. That scared him pretty bad. He, he said he run up. It was a couple hundred yards. He run up there and he got into his big tractor and then come back down there. And uh, he said nothing was there. But did you get did you get the pictures of the trees that were stripped? Yeah, I did. I did. And you know, bears in Washington will do that. They'll strip the bark off of a tree, but I've never seen a tree stripped as clean as this thing was. I mean, 
it almost looked spotless. Yeah, there was no bark on the ground. And there's fingernail marks where it's peeling that bark off them trees. Uh, some people say they ate it for medicinal purposes. I don't know, but it's it's pretty strange. Yeah, like I said, I've seen bears do that. I've never seen a, a tree strip this clean. Uh, I mean, it's spotless. And in North Texas, you guys really don't have bears there. They're in the next state, but they're working their way down slowly. Yeah, I hear you. And you would have known if it was a bear. I mean, bears make a mess when they when they take the bark off a tree like that. Uh, the picture that you sent me, um, and it looks like there's a river and then there's a bunch of bushes. And I know it's a um, motion detected uh, trail cam. It, when you first look at the picture, uh, you don't really see anything, but... Uh, I know you had zoomed in on it. It's kind of a blob squatch in there, but it's weird that the trail cam picture just went off on its own, like it detected motion. Yes. Yes, it did. Is that kind of why you investigated that picture and kind of zoomed in on it? Because it kind of just seems like a random picture that maybe something flew by and the trail cam went off. Because when you first look at it, there's really not much there. Um, but what what made you kind of investigate this this photo? That, the picture I zoomed in was just to give you a little bit uh, clearer picture of its face and its nose and its eyes. Yeah, no, I, I think it's cool that you, you got it, you know, and you started investigating it. I know you spent a lot of time uh, down there on the property, and, and by no means breaking your balls over the picture. I think it's cool that uh, you sent it. And I know that there's more that you have. Those were just a couple you had on your phone. And I would definitely love to see more of what you guys have, what you've captured on that property. Uh, but your friend has this encounter, and and you kind of go down there. You've been, been investigating the property, and some of it, some of the things we won't talk about tonight. But uh, you've been investigating it. When you first got to this property, what were some of the things that stood out to you that there's something going on here? A lot of trees snapped over. On the top of that, that big creek that runs through that property, there there are portions of the woods that are just tore all to hell. Trees snapped off 10 foot up. Looks like somebody come through there with a mortar shell and just blew them trees up. Uh, twisted trees. I told my buddy, I said, man, I can't believe this. It looks like a storm has come through the woods, but it wasn't a storm because the rest of the trees are still standing, you know. The ones that are tore up are underneath the canopy. And uh, we were talking about that. He said, it must be a big boy. And I said, well, we got a picture of him. Yeah, and I know that we're talking about doing kind of a part two show with you and your neighbor and and uh, getting all of the evidence and pictures and everything so we can post them. Because I know what you sent me was just a couple things you had on your phone. Um, I, I'm curious, though, why do you think that they're on that property? No pressure. There's water there. There's countless berry patches, uh, blackberries. There's food. There's no pressure, and it's close to the river. A lot of the old people say they're a mammal, and they migrate like the rest of the animal. But uh, I don't know. Have you ever gone down to that river around his property and, and found any tracks or anything? Just that one that I sent you, and that was on a low water crossing. And... That was hard red clay that that footprint come out of. And yeah, it, it looked like it. And you know you know as well as I do, it's hard to leave a track in that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you've seen the two, the two casts that I made. And they wasn't real good because it was an older print. But you can still see the toes and the, and the heel and the, and the insole on it. And from our conversation the other day, it didn't really seem like they're coming up to his house. They're just kind of on the property. Right. All of the trees that we found snapped off or on the side of that creek that runs through his property. Like I say, I, I think there's different kinds of them. I really do. I think there's short ones, fat ones. Uh, we've got a picture of a female, too, that she's got real big hips, real big thighs, and her the top of her is kind of thin. But the picture shows that she's turned and there's a tree there and you can see the breast sticking out on the left side of the tree. Uh, and she's got a monkey face. She looks like a monkey in the face. 
Yeah, I would definitely love to see those pictures. And I know the pictures that I have at the moment are just a couple that you had in your phone. I asked you when you're at a job set or something, if you would just send me what you have. But I'd definitely like to see more of, of what you're talking about. And I would I would love to have, I know you and I are kind of working on getting your neighbor on the show. Uh, I would definitely love to uh, have him on. Going back to your encounter, I wanted to ask you, the one that you had in 1979 when you were hunting, do you think the creature was actually was going to hurt you? I think he was curious. You know, I really do. I think he was curious because he didn't know what I was. And he didn't see me till I come out of the brush and I was on fire. I was running. Mind you, I was running across a field that had been disc and it was a little wet, but it was sandy. And I was dressed in camouflage with a uh, an army coat on, carrying a gun with a toboggan. And I'm, I'm scooting across the field trying to get away from him. I think he was curious, so I think it's the reason he come towards me. Yeah, it's definitely one of those encounters that will stay with you. And I think you're right. I think if it wanted to run you down, it could have. Uh, it was probably a little shocked and, and maybe curious. It's it's hard to say. Uh, but uh, I think if it wanted you, it, it could have had you. Uh, let me ask you, what do you think that these creatures are? I'll be honest with you. I think somebody or some agency, I think they're, they're experimenting with the human DNA with with uh, either great apes or monkeys. That's what I think because they they look look almost human. The ones I've seen and they're different. This one had a cone head. The one the big one, the alpha male that I got the picture of, he's got a round head and his hair grows back on his head. I think somebody's experimenting. I don't know why. I got a few ideas, but I'm not going to say. But I really do think somebody else is experimenting with the, with human DNA. Yeah, it's strange. I, there's such a long history of it. Uh, you know, I talked about uh, Davy Crockett there in Texas and that, that weird letter he wrote his brother-in-law. And I think I said Davy Crockett earlier in, uh, with regard to Tennessee. I meant Daniel Boone. Uh, Daniel Boone's the one that shot the Yahoo, and he describes it as a 10-foot-tall beast. And then you have all of the Native American records you know not really records but it's in their in their folklore of of these creatures and so it was way before the united states you know people were seeing these creatures way before the government was even here um do you think it was kind of a non-human primate and now they're tweaking with the dna you know if i told you something it would probably be wrong so i really don't know uh i think these these animals have been around for years i really do especially with the Indians talking about them and the different native tribes having them in their, their folklore, you know, I think they've been around for a while, but they're just kind of a recluse, you know, people say, well, why haven't they found a body? Why haven't they done this? Well, maybe they take care of their own. You know what I mean? I really don't know. Yeah. It's a, it's a fascinating take that you have TJ. I mean, it's a fair answer and, I don't think, you know, there really is no wrong answer. There's no dumb answer because no one really knows. I mean, no one really knows. I like your idea about the uh, tweaking of the DNA because there is something very weird, very strange about these creatures that doesn't quite add up, in my my humble opinion. Uh, but I can't wait to have you back for a part two, you and um, your neighbor, and uh, talk with you guys and, and find out what's going on out there. Okay. Like I say, I've got a lot more information and I've got a lot more pictures. That was just the tip of the iceberg, what I sent you. The the picture with the two shapeshifters, that, it's really interesting. Only two people have seen that the pictures that I've sent you. And only a hand people have heard this story, what I told you, about what happened in 79. So I, I'm not scared to tell the story now. I'm older. I really don't care what people think. I've been all over the world. I've been to Japan, Alaska, all over Canada, Europe, Germany, Italy, uh, France. I, I've been all over and I've seen things, but I have never seen anything like this. Anything. Yeah, and we'll discuss it more definitely in part two. And for the audience, the picture that TJ is talking about uh, with the shapeshifter 
it's this weird light. Uh, it's kind of hard to, to describe. I'll, I'll post a picture underneath this episode, and I don't really know what it is. I think when you first look at it, you're like, oh, the light's playing tricks, you know, coming through the trees. But uh, it's it's weird. There's something weird going on there. Uh, but I can't wait to have you back, TJ. And thank you so much for taking the time uh, to come on and, and share what happened to you over 40 years ago. Um, I, I really enjoyed talking with you. Well, Wes, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I felt compelled to, to give you a call. And I shot you an email and asked you if I could come on after listening to some of the stories, you know. And like I say, it's it's uh, it's been a while, but I, it feels pretty good to talk about it, you know what I mean? Yeah, it definitely does help to talk about it, and I appreciate you listening uh, to the show, TJ. And, and again, thank you again for coming on. All right, good deal. I appreciate you, man. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.